Good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to this panel. Uh, my name is Martin Chung from Hong Kong Baptist University. I have here a very distinguished panel and very promising young scholars as well. Uh, doing a topic of something very interesting called dealing with the past and no, with brackets uh, and the present. I think dealing with the past is a, a very uh, uh, interesting term itself, which probably popularized by, by this German idea of Vergangenheitsbewältigung, uh, something that was uh, coined or invented in the 1950s, actually, by the uh, German Protestants in, a, in, a, in, a, in the context of criticizing you know, the, uh, the Germans at that time in the 50s, not yet having done dealing with the past, what they call the, the Vergangenheit is not nicht bewältigt werden. So it's, it's the idea that there's nothing uh, that, yes, you know, something has stopped, the violence and the injustice and, and, and all, but then uh, some legacies have been dealt with sufficiently. So eventually uh, that concept became, you know, widely applied in, in very different contexts from East Asia to uh, Latin America, Africa, and so on, and then, of course, in, in other European countries. And uh, so today we have um, a group of scholars uh, looking at this issue um, in, in, in context of Northern Ireland, um, discussing about you know, collective memories, uh, parades, and, and also uh, you know, jokes or humor, uh, or uh, travels, tourism, um, and, and um, so linking the past and the present and dealing with the legacy. So, I will first introduce our panel here and then invite our first speaker to uh, present her paper. So, um, first of all, we have Dr. Sarah DeBreeze McQuaid here. Uh, she is an associate professor in British and Irish history, um, society and culture at Aarhus University, and she's also a core research partner at the Center for Resolution of International Conflicts at Copenhagen University. Her research revolves around how collectives remember, so dealing with collective memory, uh, and how also how they forget, you know, choose to archive their past, particularly as part of conflict and peace building processes. She's particularly interested in multi-level memory governance, a very interesting concept, <laughs> uh, where <laughs> transnational, national, and local cultural actors, processes, pro products, and practices shape each other. And on my left here, we have Dr. Katie Markham from um, um, Newcastle University. She is a lecturing associate in media, culture, and heritage. Um, she's a recent uh, PhD graduate in the Department of Sociology at the University of Leeds uh, with, a thesis, uh, with her thesis entitled, The Person Inside, the person inside It Has to Be Part of It, Empathy, Post-Conflict Heritage, and the Troubles, Tourism in Northern Ireland. And uh, this thesis offers a critical appraisal of empathy, effect, and emotion in relation to Belfast paramilitary museums and black cap mural tours. So a very interesting topic. Uh, last but not least, on my uh, uh, right over there, we have Mr. Adam Brody from the University of Oxford. Um, he's a PhD candidate there, uh, studying collective action and social conflict in post-war Northern Ireland. Prior to Oxford, he completed a BA in History and War Studies uh, and an MA in Terrorism Studies, uh, I think both at King's, right? Mm -hmm. um, okay, and um, so uh, some close associates here in this conference. His paper that uh, you know, he's going to present today is based on the second chapter of his PhD uh, project, which is entitled Collective Action in Transitional Countries, Parades, Peace, Con uh, Peace and Conflict in Post-Troubles, Northern Ireland. I see a certain conflicts there. Countries, so are you comparing well, Northern Ireland? But we'll leave it to the questions part. Priyash. I should probably also say that when yeah. uh, when I describe uh, post-war Northern Ireland, I mean post-troubles. Um, that's maybe a bit confusing. Uh, yeah, post-troubles, sorry. Uh, yeah. Okay, so without further ado, I will now invite our first paper presenter, um, Dr. McQuaid, to uh, present. And uh, we have about 20 minutes, more or less. <laughs> Thank you very much. Um, so a, a few of us um, have started our papers with some personal reflections on where we were 20 years ago. Um, and 20 years ago, I was in London watching the television as they were reporting on the final negotiations. 
um, and landed the agreement. And I was about to start um, an MA in Irish politics at Queen's that following autumn. And so when I arrived, this was of course just after the Omar bomb, but the agreement had been reached in April. I arrived uh, in September just after the bomb. And at that stage, it was quite clear that everybody, uh, certainly in the politics department, were guardedly optimistic. They were very worried about criticizing what had been reached uh, at that stage. Everybody was very careful not to unpick it, even if there were things to be disappointed with or critical about. Um, and I was quite worried when, because of Brexit, this 20th anniversary, and because of the, the breakdown of government in Northern Ireland, this 20th anniversary has almost like securitized the discourse around the agreement. So we now all have to rally around it. And uh, you know that it's unique, it can't be challenged, it can't be criticized. And I think um, while it is very important that the agreement is not lost. I think we should not lose this moment to also um, challenge it a little bit. So this work that I'm doing today is uh, when I did, I did my MA thesis work on strand three of the agreement, which nobody cared about because everybody thought it was a sub to unionism at the last minute, that they would get these east-west links. But now, of course, in the uh, context of Brexit, this uh, particular body is becoming more interesting. Um, which is good for the revival of my thesis. Uh, and my PhD work then was on um, partial agreements, so tracing how the conflict had been construed and how resolutions or solutions to the conflict had been construed since, since Sunningdale and up until the St. Andrews Agreement. And in a way, in the past five years, as uh, as you heard in the introduction, I've been working with uh, collective memory also as part of, of dealing with the past as a driver both of, of further conflict but also for conflict resolution. And so in that case, I've been looking at the past 20 years of trying to uh, reach some kind of agreement on how to deal with the past, which, which wasn't part of the peace agreement as such. Um, and so because I've been working with people who work with other contexts than Northern Ireland, I've been forced to model my work more and try to draw out the general lessons and try what are the things that we can learn from Northern Ireland, what are the things that can be transferred to other contexts. And, um, and, and in that case, I've tried to come up with a, with a model called the Northern Ireland model of dealing with the past, uh, which is um, a model you will see which is not kind of, it's not, it's not a big bang model. It, it doesn't come into view immediately. It is coming into view after 20 years uh, of negotiations between what was agreed in 98 and what has since been tried to, to be agreed, but also in the contestations between what civil society has done to deal with the past. Because even though um, there isn't a big legacy architecture to deal with all the aspects of the past as such, there has been a lot of dealing with the past uh, in all sorts of ways, as we also heard in, in Stuart's paper. Um, anyway, so I'm, I'm trying to, to come up with a model. Uh, and I just realized that um, you know if it took 30 years to get a peace agreement and 20 years plus to get an agreement on how to deal with the past, it's not really a model you can implement very fast anywhere unless you have 50 years <laughs> to, to work on it. Yes, it'll all come in time. Anyways, um, I'm using these kind of terms, uh, radical disagreement and, and the accompanying idea of agonism, which is becoming very popular in all sorts of literature, but particularly in peace building um, um, and memory studies that we shouldn't try to get rid of differences, uh, but we need to be able to address them uh, within the democratic sphere. And basically, that's a lot of what the agreement was about also. So the paper will start out with um, an introduction to radical disagreement and, and a kind of an argument for the agreement in 98 being an institutionalization of radical disagreement that in a way kind of enshrined the key contradiction of the conflict. Um, so it didn't try to transcend it or transform it. It just accepted it as the way it has been and will be. Um, and I'll get back to that. And then after that, I'll talk a little bit about what that has meant for kind of the ambiguous transition <laughs> that is inherent in the agreement. 
um, and the changing political landscapes and changing norms in peace building that uh, influence then what you can do in policy. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about what policy discourses has then done to kind of negotiate that terrain. And then finally, I'll try to, to, to give you an idea of what the model is. Okay, so on the one hand, uh, we have the agreement. And the agreement, while it didn't talk about the past in institutional or structural terms, uh, in terms of how it should be dealt with, it has, of course, given shape to everything that has been done since. And that this negotiation, I think, is, is quite interesting. And then we've had a lot of different influences on dealing with the past. So there are artistic responses to the past. We've had a lot of those, a lot of uh, exhibitions, traveling exhibitions, um, a lot of uh, kind of architecture, both in the, in the shape of the Peace Bridge in Derry, but also Hands Across the Divide. We've had a lot of academic uh, interventions in how to deal with the past, some of whom are with us in the room. And, and suggestions on how to implement political ideas about going about it. We've had something like the Ames Bradley uh, report in 2009, where it's a big consultation. So bottom-up processes, artistic processes, top-down processes, also with the Bloody Sunday Inquiry, historical inquiries team. So there are I mean, many, many different ways. But piecemeal, ad hoc, and I'll get back to how it has been piecemeal and ad hoc. So basically, w one of the things to understand about the Northern Ireland model is, of course, that it's a negotiation between what was agreed and then the way that people have navigated around the fact that there hasn't been policy agreement on the past. Oh, and Boston College. <laughs> <laughs> Just <a> remember, <laughs> boom. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, actually, good effect, but not intended. Um, there you go. Uh, so this is, of course, one of the things that I mean that has been. I mean, some of the conversations that has been had. Uh, have been conditioned by the reception of some of these projects uh, and how they have uh, gone beyond what maybe the founders of them meant them to be able to do. So in this, in this case, for instance, having something which could be an oral history archive slip into to criminal testimony. Okay, so just to introduce these terms, and I, yesterday, when uh, after Stuart's talk, and I said, well, oh, I have some theory. This is literally what I have. I mean, there's nothing else. This is, this is the theory slide. Um, and, but it's one of those things that when you try to model something, you have to, you have to say, okay, so we'll use the terms of the field. Um, to try and, and place it. And so I was interested uh, in this idea of, of Oliver Ramsbottom, which is developed in terms of Israel and Palestine. And really it's a term that's developed when there is no end in sight. You know, the kind of thing where, um, where, where you don't really think that there is a solution, certainly not a, or a compromise. And so uh, he's saying that radical disagreement is when parties refuse to distinguish positions from interests and needs, when they object to reframing competition into shared problem solving or reshape adversarial debate into constructive controversy. But what he also says then is that if you have a radical disagreement like whether Northern Ireland should be British or Irish, and it, if it can't be both at the same time, at least in constitutional terms, um, <clears throat> instead of overcoming that radical disagreement, we should understand it, explore it, and manage it. And I would say that the agreement is a very good example of not trying to transcend differences, but actually move on from the basis of these differences so that, you know, that we're not expecting the main political question or political conflict to ever be different from this. Um, and, and if we accept that, we can get agreement on how to do politics, but not necessarily very productive politics. We can get back to that. And so I would say that the agreement is a case of institutionalizing radical disagreement. The problem with that is not that it, it's not just the power sharing that I know a lot of people discussed yesterday about consociationalism. Um, <coughs> it's not just the power sharing and, and the designation of unionism and nationalism. It's also the enshrining in the agreement of future projects. So people are not just political culture bearers of a particular past, but also a particular future. And so there is no fusion of horizons uh, in this, which is problematic. Okay, so then, but so clearly 
We're not trying to negotiate away differences here. We're recognizing them. We're even institutionalizing them. So that led me to thinking about this idea of agonism. <coughs> and Chantal Mouffe's idea, and this is of course within kind of as an alternative to deliberative democracy, where you think you can remove all power bases and people can talk at an, at an even playing field. And she's saying, really, we should not try to gloss over differences and, 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 and different power positions. We should recognize them, but at the same time, we should transform enemies into adversaries. And so this is, again, about how you do things. You don't kill each other. You maybe just annihilate people in a debate. <laughs> Um, so you don't eliminate antagonism, and democratic politics should be about mobilizing um, uh, people towards democratic design. So we can argue that the peace agreement certainly did that. It brought everybody into the democratic fold. Um, but what it also did was it didn't really become agonistic pluralism. Uh, it became agonistic dualism. <laughs> so it becomes very much, as we heard in the last panel, I mean, it, it needs a unionist nationalist angle, otherwise it doesn't count. Um, and while we then got to extremism of ends, because people still have their future projects, which are mutually exclusive, uh, we don't have extremism of means in terms of violence. But it's not really the agonistic pluralism that we could hope for, because it goes beyond acknowledging dimensions of power to constitutionally privileging two positions and thus removing them from the political by enshrining their politics. So this is the idea of, uh, of thinking about that. And that obviously, uh, I mean, in a way, gives shape to uh, the political appetite for dealing with the past, which is one of the things that is very, very difficult to find uh, agreement on, both in substantial and processual terms both on what it is and how to do it. Um, okay, now I, have, I had done this thing where I was gonna click on everything here and I'm gonna put them all on, sorry to, yes. <clears throat> so part of, of this, this long period, the 30 years conflict and parallel attempts to solve the conflict throughout, so negotiations throughout, more or less, um, but now also this period that we're calling the peace process, we're still calling it a peace process, it's still a process. Um, so we have in a way, if you're going to deal with the past, it's, it's a lot easier if you agree, uh, uh, if the ending is, <coughs> is more clear. A compromise quite uh, models things, I think. But also, it's, you know, if it's from dictatorship to democracy, that is one transition that you can recognize. But you can't really say that's the case in Northern Ireland. I mean, unionist rule certainly had its democratic, democratic deficits, as did direct rule, but you couldn't really call it a dictatorship. So it's not that kind of transition. We already know it's a, it wasn't a full-scale war in terms of battle deaths, maybe, but you know, is it from war to peace? Is what we have now peace? Is what we had then war? It's not really a paradigmatic transition that we can recognize as such. Is it from anarchy to the rule of law? Yes, certainly the monopoly of violence was, was challenged throughout the conflict, but at the same time, quite a lot of people or the state was functioning throughout the conflict as well. Um, so all these kinds of, you know, it's from what to what. Often when we talk about transitional justice, we don't actually dwell enough on what the transition is about, you know, from what to what. Um, and so, so <laughs> the thing is that as we can also see with Brexit, what is written into the agreement is what will happen if the status of Nor um, what needs to happen for the status of Northern Ireland to change in the agreement is only one from British to Irish. Nobody imagined that the UK would leave the European Union. And so this is to say we are over the 20 years since the agreement, so many things have changed, really changing political landscape, not just in the sense that we have Brexit, but also in the sense that we have consecutive minority governments in the UK, which nobody thought. I mean, they have a whole voting system in place to not have coalition and minority governments. And in the Republic, Sinn Féin has grown to be a very, very large party. So kind of the political economy of, of, of Northern Ireland, uh, seen in this broader British-Irish perspective, perspective is, is very, very different. 
So that's a completely different political landscape. But also in terms of changing norms in peace building and conflict resolution. So in 2000, we have the UN Resolution 1325 about women in peace building, uh, which they talked about in the, in, the, in the panel before. We have the local turn in peace building. We have transitional justice becoming an ever more important uh, kind of paradigm for, for guiding transitions. And all this is going on after the agreement, but while we're still implementing the agreement, and so it becomes a navigating exercise between these very, very different processes. And because Northern Ireland, I mean, everybody goes through dynamic change, and uh, regardless of where they're in, but because Northern Ireland is thought of as still in process, this becomes uh, more crucial. Yes, I'm trying to get to my point. <clears throat> At the same time, um, this is a quote from Taitel, who um, works on human rights and transitional justice. She says, the conception of justice in periods of political change it is extraordinary and constructivist, both constituted by and constitutive of transition. And so it's quite clear that what is thought to be justice, uh, um, and I would argue also what is thought to be truth about the past in terms of coming to terms with the past, which is another term of dealing with the past, um, is, has changed and is changing all the time. It is an ongoing negotiation. And there is a clear clash of paradigms here between a kind of a peace building paradigm of power sharing where you bring former uh, violent combatants in, you know, by giving them a stake in power, and then these transitional justice idea where it's, it's an ongoing um, negotiation where human rights have, has, has a lot to say. Okay, so. Consequences for policy. How has it been piecemeal and ad hoc and what well, and how? <laughs> how and how? Um, I think it's fair to say in simplistic terms, very simplistic terms, that there has been an, an attempt to, to deal with different parts of truth and different parts of justice in different ways, right? So um, for instance, uh, if we take this is from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission in South Africa, after they gave, gathered all their evidence uh, at the commission, they put them into different kinds of truths. So narrative truths, which is the individual story about what happened to you. Forensic truths, is, which is what can be proven uh, in for forensic um, examinations. Social truths, the kinds of things that society can agree on. And restorative truths, the kinds of things that society can agree on and use to move forward, right? And so we might say that certainly narrative truths have been pursued in oral history projects, forensic truths, historical requirements, uh, inquiries team, uh, social truths, some of these legacy, uh, um, well, Bloody Sunday, I guess, could also be, uh, the inquiry could also be an example of that. And restorative truths, um, it, uh, you know, trying to find out what would be acceptable to most people. Um, and then on the other hand, justice, constitutional justice, that was achieved with the agreement by giving people a stake in power, or particular people, a stake in power. It is turning out to be not constitutional justice for all. Legal justice uh, is of course pursued uh, in the courts. Historical justice is the right to rewrite history in the light of what has happened and what we learned from it and what we have unearthed. And then restorative uh, justice is, of course, again, what we can do to, to heal society. And so one of the things, and I have like one minute left now. No, um, more than that. Oh, two minutes, <laughs> yes, perfect. Okay, so the reason why I called the paper nothing is agreed until everything is agreed is because it seemed like dealing with the past became this kind of mutual so rather than in the negotiation literature, nothing is agreed until everything is agreed, is meant to be this creative platform where you can just air any crazy idea you have and they're not binding until you agree that they're binding. However, often in negotiations, certainly in Northern Ireland, it becomes this mutual construction and destruction clause, right? So you add all your <laughs> issues to whatever package uh, to have it agreed, and this is certainly what has happened in dealing with the past, where, for instance, welfare reform has been attached to, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, so if I look at the chain of texts, um, and I can't do that in, in, um, in, very, in very much detail, I'm trying to find the particular quote, but there is a, 
it's a very particular quote about how okay so in the in the Stormont House Agreement um, which isn't in Haas, uh, the House of Solomon um, talks that preceded them. There is an explicit and repeated line which stipulates that these institutions, so the three kinds of institutions that were set up that I don't have time to introduce, but are there, uh, <laughs> um, uh, have to be transparent, fair, and equal, and that these key principles should ensure that the new institutions must not seek to rewrite history. And it was also, there was, they tried to establish very firm relationships between if there was an oral history archive, that micro truth should not lead to macro truths. So there was this kind of boundary making between the kinds of truths and justice. But of course, these bleed into each other, as we saw with Boston College, for instance. So you can't really do that. OK, so. Sorry. Uh, uh, what is the Northern Ireland model? Here it is. It is, I agree with Tom Hennessy that I don't think that it's ambiguous. It does just straight out promise people that they can have it all, <laughs> just not at the same time. <laughs> um, there you are. Um, what is uh, the process of dealing with the past? This is actually you know, the, how the UK non-written non constitution is usually described as a dry stone wall, um, where you try to fit pieces that, you know, and I think that that's what's happening between societal discourses and it's a very, so the Northern Ireland model is very pluralistic, <coughs> it's very complex, it's quite contradictory. Um, and, but what we can see is that at the level of society, perhaps because we have a deadlock at the political level, the conversations that can be held about the past have been more pluralist than dualist because the political level haven't owned them. At the same time, they have also been more guarded because we don't know eventually what policy framework might catch the whole thing. So my argument would be, and sorry, that is the very last slide, and then I'll stop. What can you model for in Northern Ireland? I would say it's a model for agonistic dualism in the internal track one, so between the parties in Northern Ireland. However, I think that it's agonistic pluralism at the level of civil society and also at the transnational level because what uh, the absence of policy framework has done is also allow, for instance, the EU to come in with funding, with funding stipulations about reconciliation, which has then in turn been um, defined from the bottom up like people uh, like uh, Brandon Hamburg, Ronya Kelly, et cetera, et cetera. So I'd say that there are some forms of, of justice and some forms of truths that it works better for. And that's it. Thank you very much. Thank you. So thank you for Dr. McQuaid for actually setting the tone for our entire panel, I would say, uh, because later on we have uh, um, uh, other papers look, looking at perhaps the ad hoc and piecemeal uh, attempts at uh, dealing with truth and justice and all. So may I now invite our second speaker, Dr. Katie Markham from uh, Newcastle University to uh, present a paper with the title, Cheers for the Lovely Time UDA. Uh, <laughs> Sick jokes and humor in Belfast troubles tourism sector. Okay, great, thank you. I slightly regret starting with that title because I'm not really going to talk about the UDA uh, <laughs> much at all. Um, the, the paper has changed slightly. Yes. Um, I'm just going to launch straight work in. Work in progress. Yeah. That's it, yeah. Kind just of like the peace process. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Okay. Um, so I'm just going to launch straight in with this because I've tried to fit too much in um, as usual. So 2018 has been a good year for Northern Irish comedy. From the unexpected return of original conflict caper Give My Head Peace, through to the riotous debut of Lisa McGee's Dairy Girls, humorous reflections on the troubles seem to be experiencing something of a renaissance in the North. Such a sharp shift in popular accounts of the Northern Irish conflict seems to be fortuitous, given that we are fast approaching this 20th anniversary of the Good Friday Agreement. And indeed, as evidenced by the rapturous social media responses um, to Dairy Girls in particular, in spite of the seriousness with which it is treated in more mainstream media, the hunger for more humorous and I think by some ways by implication more realistic depictions of people's lives during the conflict seems to be very real. And this is something that Lisa McGee has herself acknowledged um, where she's kind of sort of uh, suggested that in spite of the routine bomb scares and shootings that were a fundamental 
part of Northern Irish citizenship at the time, life during the Troubles had an undeniably comic edge, and that's one that popular culture is really only now starting to grapple with. The strength of the intersections between conflict and comedy has, within a literary context at least, been well observed. Where academic um, work from critics such as Terence Duprez has drawn attention to the frequent surfeits of dark humour found in writing about and from survivors of the Holocaust. Extending that kind of further among psychologists, it's well acknowledged that, that gallows jokes, which involve um, making light of your imminent mortality, can be a powerful antidote to the trauma um, experience when you're confronted with death. However, on a sociological level, whilst there's a much broader body of literature that explores the power dynamics that are inherent to the construction of a joke, very little of this tends to be translated into a post-conflict context. And I think this is surprising, given the obvious patterns we, see, we can see emerging in countries um, recovering from war, where certainly it's been the case for Northern Ireland. Post-conflict nations can quite quickly gain reputations abroad, at least, for having um, a very grim sense of humour that, that kind of quickly becomes identified as a national trope in some essences. Even within the context of Irish studies, I think this trope has been um, somewhat neglected. And whilst the 2012 Belfast Comedy Festival um, did host a panel on this very specific topic, academic work in the area has tended to be much more tentative. And this is where my own research into troubles, tourism, and conflict heritage within Belfast comes into play. At first, a pleasant quirk um, of the sites and interactions that I was having whilst undertaking fieldwork in Belfast in general. The persistence with which comedic reflections on the past emerged across both the paramilitary museums and the mural tours that I was analysing soon became the source of kind of fascination in and of itself, where humour seemed to interact with wider concerns I had around empathy in quite um, intriguing ways. From comments found um, in the visitor books at the Andy Tyree Interpretive Centre, which cheerfully or maybe ironically thanked the UDA for a lovely time, or the cheekily emblazoned slogans found on labels attached to display cases in that same museum, through to the random bursts of laughter that you can sometimes hear from tour groups um, as they gathered around one of West Belfast murals, it became apparent that humour has been quite embedded into the tourist experience um, of the Troubles in, in this moment. However, less apparent is the precise function that this laughter actually fulfills for those tourists and what, if any, impact um, that could have on political narratives and understandings of the conflict in the present amongst that demographic. Like my focus really is on kind of tourist understanding in particular. So what follows um, in this paper is a kind of auto-ethnographic slash ethnographic account of a black cab mural tour that I took part in um, a few years ago, which seemed to illustrate to me both some of the possibilities, but also the restrictions that dark humour places on our engagement with the past in post-agreement Northern Ireland. So over the course of my PhD research, I undertook ethnographies of 12 different black cab tours, from a variety of um, companies and these incorporated drivers from a variety of political perspectives. But this one in 2015 happened to be the first one that I did in the company um, of others at, at the time. Brief bit of context for people that aren't familiar with the particularities of the Black Cab Tour. I know that the um, walking tours are kind of much better known, there's been quite a lot written on them, but Black Cab Tours are different on, I think, two fundamental levels. So firstly, unlike the walking tours, um, tourists on the Black Cab Tour are guaranteed to have the same guide through the duration of their tour, which means that guides themselves are often required to cross into districts that historically they may not have entered, depending on their particular um, kind of political allegiance. And secondly, and it's kind of a consequence of having that same guide, although a significant proportion of Black Cab have guides do have historical connections to paramilitary organisations on both sides. They rarely reveal the specifics of this to their tourists until the end of the tour. Um, and this withholding, it's usually argued by the guides, is um, out of a desire to maintain a politically neutral narrative, whatever that means, for their tourists, um, which for a lot of the guides I spoke to, they argued that was really fundamental to the success of their business. That's kind of partly how they sell themselves. These differences um, are in many ways fundamental to our understanding of how humour might then work within these contexts, not least because, as Linda Hutchin has observed, jokes are often responsible for creating and reinforcing distinct in-and-out groups. 
So to get a joke, Hutchin argues, is to be marked um, as one of the in-group, and that's an allegiance that is constructed partially through the ability to laugh um, in conjunction with a group of people. And of course, on the flip side of that, you have sociologists like Michael Billig that, who observe that, that being part of that out-group usually involves being the butt of that witticism, and of course, that's a position that's usually occupied by um, most marginalised in society, not always, but, but often. These positionings are undeniably true of humour's function within tourism in general, um, where authors such as Pierce and Pavel have noted that tour guides will um, frequently use humour to create a shared sense of identity between people that are otherwise um, kind of complete strangers to each other. However, in the case of Troubles Tourism, I think humour's ability to reflect and also construct social groups is layered with that additional dynamic whereby the dominant in-group that you may identify with through that joke may, through particular linguistic or affective equivalences, also be one of the groups responsible for causing injury <coughs> during the conflict. And this is something that, as a tourist, you might not necessarily <coughs> um, reflect on in the moment. So this first function of humour as a means of marking out these in and out groups um, was made apparent to me from the start of this first tour that I undertook in 2015, when two of our group, which included a friend of mine who runs a and b business in Belfast, took off to collect beer for the tour. Such a move, while surprising at the time, I've since been told is not entirely unusual on these tours, which have been known to cater to the occasional stag weekend. Um, and the two in question, who are both residents in Belfast and the wider Belfast area, appear to be oblivious to the discomfort that this caused me and the um, two American backpackers who were also with us at the time who had been staying with my friend in this B&B. And within a few minutes they returned with a six pack of Desperados and began to like, distribute it amongst the group. So it was at this point that the first in what would turn out to be a series of increasingly competitive humorous exchanges started between my friend and the tour guide. As once in the car, um, the driver started with the usual preamble by asking what people knew about the conflict. My friend who had lived in North Belfast her whole life and volunteered on a number of cross-community projects began to reel off a list of her qualifications, as it were, adding towards the end that she also used to do the odd tour um, for some of her B&B guests. And as if on cue, um, the guide reached through the hatch towards us and mimed, kind of grabbing for her beer, um, suggested that in that case she could get in the front and do the tour and he'd sit and have a drink with the rest of us. In that moment, there's nothing particularly remarkable about that exchange, although it did elicit some kind of nervous laughter from the American backpackers and a slightly sardonic smile on, on the face of my friend. However, looking back on this moment in the context of the overall tour, it became apparent that this was one of the first moments where those subtle boundaries between different social groups in that car really started to be established. One of the primary ways that these boundaries get drawn um, on these tours in general, I argue, is through the performative nature of the crack. Now, Mark McGovern obviously has written extensively about this particular dimension of Irish sociality, um, and he suggests it's becoming something of a burden for people working in the tourist sector who are expected to live up to this very ethnicised notion um, of Irishness. And this is no less true for those working in the black cab mural industry, um, who, as these quotes my interviewee suggested, are often acutely aware of the mercenary but also emotional rewards um, that can come from giving their customers a bit of the crap whilst on tour. Indeed, when asked specifically about the role that humour played on their tours, um, guides often gave quite a wide uh, range of reasons for including this. Um, and, and whilst these kind of reasons would include, I think, more uh, kind of interesting things like emotional self-preservation, they tended to ultimately always reinforce McGovern's complaints about the commodification of this particular form of humour. And you know, as one of my more cynical participants said, um, it's up there somewhere going from bar to bar and giving them the crack, they flipping love it. And this is something that, that um, a lot of these guys will do. They'll do a tour and then take um, tourists to the Crown or another big Belfast pub afterwards. There are also signs that, that um, local councils are themselves actively involved in curating these pressures. So a training and product knowledge video developed by the Northern Ireland Tourist Board and featuring the comedian Tim McGarry was distributed amongst taxi drivers in Belfast in 2009. Specifically encouraging drivers to perform the crack for their punters, um, the video involves McGarry driving around key sightseeing spots in the city and offering a series of quick one-liners that 
um, the, the viewers are explicitly <coughs> encouraged to plagiarise. As McGarry himself says at the start of the video, what do tourists want? They want a bit of information and a good crack, and that's, what I, that's where us taxi drivers come in. While the success of that video can't be measured in terms of uptake because DVDs were handed out randomly, many of those jokes and anecdotes that, that McGarry tells in the video I have heard retold by other taxi drivers and on occasion black cab guides themselves, suggesting either the video had some kind of broader impact or alternatively um, that McGarry was lifting his jokes from a pre-existing crack archive, as it were. <laughs> Where is it? <laughs> Now, McGovern has listed the main features of a commodified crack as including an atmosphere of conviviality, a sense of collectivity, and a supposedly ethnically verbal dexterity, as well as kind of the presence of alcohol. In terms of the taxi tour I took part in in 2015, many of those commodified signifiers of the crack were present, including um, the aforementioned desperados. As such, to those immediate outsiders on the tour, that quick exchange between my friends um, and our guide was in some ways easily presentable as just another dynamic of this convivial Irish culture and not in itself significant. However, talking to my friend afterwards, I realized that there was a distinct power play at work in that moment and kind of set of negotiations that were being worked out um, through that humorous exchange. Like I said, my friend had lived in Belfast her whole life, um, but she'd never actually been on any troubles tour before. Um, and years spent as a community worker had made her quite cynical about this form of tourism, um, which of course is a cynicism that quite a lot of the community um, sector shares. On those grounds then, um, the challenge invoked by the guide when he suggested that she could take over that tour was a very real one to her. Um, but the humorous tone that it was delivered in just concealed that friction from the rest of us on the group who would just interpret it as being a bit of good crack. So in this way, those inside-outside dynamics that Hutchin argues are fundamental to the joke were at work from the beginning of the tour. And two very different narratives had the potential to emerge at that point, which depending on your level of understanding, either confirmed the general geniality of the tour and the presence of crack, or suggested a more combative use of humour was at work. And this reading is, of course, entirely in keeping with McGovern's thesis on um, the crack in general, where, or the historical role that the crack's played in sociality, where he argues it often functioned as quite a closed system um, of exchange amongst Irish migrants in particular. So I've, as I've already indicated, the exchanges and jibes between my friend and the tour guide kind of really continued throughout the tour and got quite tense at various points, but there was one key moment when the kind of hermetic, that closed nature of the crack um, was really breached and humour's use as a means of controlling discourses and the conflict became a bit clearer. And that was when we arrived outside the Sinn Féin offices in West Belfast. And at this moment, we literally just stepped out of the car um, and my friend uh, effectively stunned the guide into silence when she raised her fist in the air and shouted up the ra in an ironic gesture of solidarity with the IRA. Now our guide, who I knew from interviewing him previously, had been a committed Republican his whole life, just paused really awkwardly and then sort of nervously <coughs> chuckled and just said, oh, I haven't heard that one in a while. Um, I'm not going to unpack what made that moment so painfully ironic because it's obviously clear to all of us here. But what I think my friend's chant in that moment did expose was um, the fallacy of the claims made by these tour guides about their ability to impart a completely neutral narrative on these tours. And that's a kind of fallacy that, that um, humour often plays a substantial role in perpetuating. One example of this kind of fallacy of neutrality was an instance um, in which another tour guide on another tour um, stood outside the King Billy mural in Shankill and proceeded to try and elicit a smile from us as he told us about an occasion when he'd nearly come to blows with a Protestant local over his insistence, the guide's insistence, that King William was gay. Tapping into broader discourses in Northern Ireland about unionism's historic issues of homophobia, our guide's conclusion that there's a lot of that here can be read in terms of the elliptical logics that Judith Butler describes as fundamental to the concept of injurious speech. Now for Butler, um, injurious speech is powerful um, precisely because it is often communicated to us more through disposition than conventional linguistics, meaning that what matters when we talk about others in a negative way is less the words themselves 
and more their delivery, the effects of which can be effective and very long-lasting. And jokes, of course, are one of the oldest forms of injurious speech. We all know from being subject to or party to racist, sexist, homophobic jokes that their power lies less in the actual words used and more in their delivery, where the context in which they deliver tends to be what disturbs us and, and, and annoys us. This link between sociality, spatiality, and then the subtext of a joke is particularly significant on the Black Cab tour, given the general importance that space and social interaction plays in tourist engagement with the West Belfast landscape. As such, standing in the Shankill in that moment, it became clear that when the guy gestured to the space we were in and ruefully suggested that there's a lot of that here, the here in this instance was not intended to refer to the wider West Belfast area, and indeed later on the guide gave us a much more favourable narrative of, um, of how of nationalism's relationship to um, issues around homophobia and racism, but was exclusively targeted at the loyalist or unionist, unionist community. And couched in the form of a joke, this moment could easily have passed me by as a tourist were it not for the fact that by that point I'd become quite aware of, of the role that humour seemed to be playing on these tours. Now obviously, these two cases I've highlighted above are just two instances of particularly revealing, but in some ways more deviant uses of humour on these tours, and they can't really be said to constitute a pattern um, on that basis. Nevertheless, the elliptical logic of injurious speech does find its way into some of the more conventional jokes and anecdotes told by guides on these tours, and I want to just briefly finish by considering these. So I've got a slideshow of some of the more common jokes used here. Such jokes are perhaps prime examples of dark humour at its finest, and they're used widely by all guides across the tour companies. So these are just some of them I've heard repeated on different occasions. Now what I want to argue here is that there are two entirely antithetical interpretations we could take when analysing the particular prevalence of these jokes on these tours. The first would be to read them, um, as I did in my thesis, solely through a spatial lens, recognising that the telling of these jokes in areas once scarred by conflict has a very particular effect on tourists' understanding of the space they're now in. Indeed, it's significant that these jokes are nearly always told either by the peace wall or when viewing the international wall. However, I've never heard a joke like this arise when in view of the much more militaristic murals found in the Shankill. What this suggests to me is an acute awareness amongst guides that such jokes only work when we're in spaces that could, however superficially, be considered as post-conflict. And strategically, of course, telling these jokes in the more demilitarized areas of West Belfast also serves to reinforce the broader narrative sold by guides on these tours about the post-conflict nature of Northern Ireland. However, there is another much more generous interpretation that we could take of these jokes, which is where I'm trying to extend my thinking and research in the future. So going back to Butler's work again on injurious speech, it's notable that although she condemns this speech on the grounds that it contributes to the negative construction of subjectivity, she also acknowledges that there is a flip side to this, which are, in her words, the occasion for something we might still call agency. This agency, Butler argues, comes about through the reappropriation and resignification of certain words into ways and contexts which have never yet been legitimated. So this is the other alternative understanding that we could apply to dark humour that we see listed here. Still recognising, of course, that the teller of these jokes may frequently be too closely allied to the violence reference to constitute a complete reappropriation, there is nevertheless something powerful about the universality with which these jokes are shared by drivers from across the political spectrum and the power that's evoked by casually referencing violence of the past in the place it once took place. Such power could be conceptualised as a form of counter-memory, which is a framework used by Anna Sheftil as she talks about dark humour's um, place in, in post-war Yugoslavia. Um, and again, like Butler's idea of injurious speech, it could be a source of agency for the complex historic victims. Quite how empowering these jokes might be for those communities actually living in and around those torn sites remains to be seen and of course requires a lot more research to really establish. But I do think it's perhaps worth exploring this hypothesis in addition to outlining all of the drawbacks that I've already discussed in this paper. As the sharp wit found in shows like Dairy Girls reminds us, the crack is indeed mighty when it comes to articulating more lifelike representations of the troubles. 
but it is also undeniably a mite that needs treating with care. Thank you, Dr. Martin. So thank you for giving the time, and also I think bring out the uh, the, the, uh, the 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 core idea that jokes can be uh, curative but also injurious at the same time, depending on who is doing the laughing, and uh, as well the, the, uh, about the commodification of the troubles, whether it's something good or you know something ambiguous for the uh, uh, post agreement uh, reconciliation process. And in the meantime, I would like to acknowledge the presence of Professor Hennessy in our panel. Uh, highlighting or gracing our event here. Um, and uh, now we have our third speaker for this panel, uh, Mr. Adam Brody, with the topic um, of his paper. Uh, is it show Yeah, it's showing. Is it? In no, the, just now. Is it coming up right? Because it, it's, it's, uh, it's not. Uh, it's, 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 it's coming up weirdly on. My oh, no, okay, I'm being yes. Oh, no, it's fine. It's fine. Sorry. Right. So. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, without further ado, uh, Adam, please. Okay, um, so my research project is entitled Resolution is Possible, explaining the end of the Crumlin Road Parades dispute. Um, in effectively, uh, I chart the dialogue process that led to uh, one of the few bits of good news to come out of Northern Ireland in the post-agreement phase, which is the end of the longest running and arguably most contentious since uh, Drum Cree. Um, parade dispute that of the uh, sorry as I just need to let me read this that of the uh, the territorial dispute on the Crumlin Road between the communities of uh, between the nationalist community of the Ardoyne and the uh, Protestant community of the Twadell. Now what this what this uh, research project is effectively doing is examining. How do, how do we go about resolving conflicts which appear intractable? In this case, how do you go about resolving a, t a territorial uh, uh, a situation where you have two ethnic groups which say that a piece of territory is theirs and, uh, and it's completely indivisible, there's no way to divide to divvy it up, it's just we both say that this is ours. Um, it's also about asking how is this sort of issue resolved in possibly the worst context imaginable. North Belfast, which is, as we all know, uh, characterized by high levels of deprivation, um, has really, has shockingly high uh, uh, rates of uh, uh, deaths from drug overdose and suicide. Um, there were 41 suicides in North Belfast in 2016, for example. Um, is high, it's a highly, polit it's a highly politically fragmented as well, so there's no clear authority structures within the area. In the nationalist side, uh, Sinn Féin, SDLP, and uh, various dissident groups all have, uh, strong, all have fairly strong power bases. In, on the Protestant side, uh, you see the PUP, um, <coughs> DUP, and UUP again, and the various paramilitary groups all have territory within North Belfast. And then there's the final problem of there is an immense legacy of conflict within the area. Um, there were, according to Martin Sutton's index of deaths, uh, 577 people were killed in North Belfast during the Troubles, um, and 390 of those were civilians, and that's the highest civilian death count of the Troubles. Uh, also, um, North Belfast was also the place where the most Protestants were killed during the Troubles. Um, so it's you're talking about a space that is riven with conflict um, uh, and its legacy. So, these are, this is the problem, effectively. Um, I'll, I'll show you on a map later, but effectively, there are, five, there are, as you can see here, six parades, six Protestant parades that go um, up the Crumlin, that uh, traverse the Crumlin Road at set times of year, every year. Um, three apprentice boys parades that all take place in the morning. Um, one Royal Black Preceptory parade that takes place in the morning, and two Orange Order parades. And the most problematic ones are the Orange Order parades, not because it's the Orange Order necessarily, but because they traverse the Crumlin Road in the evening. Um, which, I mean, you know, you, you get some, you get a bunch of unionist stereotyping about this, basically saying that Catholics are too lazy to get up and, and properly oppose parades uh, if they take place in the morning. Obviously, this is 
horrendous and, and somewhat sectarian. But the truth of the matter is, is that uh, it's just a lot easier to, I think it's just a lot easier to mobilize people to come out and oppose something at around about six o'clock in the evening than it is at eight o'clock in the morning. Um, and so it means that those parades are not only uh, gen tend to be more protested, like you get more people protesting them, you also have a much higher uh, chance of, of riots breaking out during them due to people getting drunk at that time as well. So this is a vision of the contested space. So as you can see, um, so the, as you can see from the, the thing, uh, the greener the space is the more Catholics they live in it, and, and conversely, the red of the space is the more Protestants live in it. Um, the, uh, between the two blue lines, which uh, are the informal borders imposed by the Parade Commission, or is it, it is the space which the Parade Commission deems as the contentious space of the Crumlin Road. Um, it's about 800 meters long. So there have been 15 years of conflict over a span of road that is 800 meters long, takes about five minutes to walk, and it's led to the biggest riots in the same. This isn't sort of important. Uh, black lines, peace lines, they demonstrate again like just the legacy of conflict in this region. So, uh, and here we have, and so these are the problems with the parades. Um, as we encounter them in sort of two, from 2000, <coughs> between 2001 and 2004, uh, these are the big problems that you identify with the parade. So first of all is the territorial problem. Um, Catholics say that that, is, <coughs> that an 800 meter stretch of road is Catholic territory. Protestants say, no it isn't, because there's shops along it, and therefore it's commercial space and it's neutral territory. Um, there is <coughs> no agreement on this. This is still a this is still a, con uh, a, a live disagreement between both sides. No one agrees as to whose territory it is. Um, at that time, there are also there was also the problem of the parade followers, which were mobile crowds that would follow the sort of more official parade <coughs> participants, um, and as I as I point out, there would often engage in offensive behaviour. For example, shouting out uh, slogans like "UFF, UFF" as they pass by the Ardoin. Um, and one particularly contentious parade, um, a crowd of uh, followers actually walked ahead of the parade, and at their head was William John Borland. Um, as you can imagine, the <coughs> residents of the Ardoin were not particularly happy about this. Um, the parades are also watched by static crowds. Um, now these, the, uh, these crowds are, tend to behave less offensively, but they are in other ways more problematic because they, they basically uh, gather at the mouth of the Twedell Avenue, which is uh, sort of here-ish. And they are problematic because they become the target for any uh, you know, Catholic youth who wants to lob a bottle or a petrol bomb at someone, and they also uh, have a... And you, basically, if you get two crowds facing one another, uh, riots are very easy to break... Uh, can very easily break out in those kinds of situations. And the other big problem uh, for the Catholic uh, Ardoin was the policing of the parades. Um, so stand, So uh, one thing you'll hear a lot, about, a lot of Protestants say is, why the hell do the Catholics care so much about this parade? It goes past their homes in five minutes. Why, like, why would you even bother protesting such a minor inconvenience? Thing is, for the Catholics, though, it's not a minor inconvenience because, PS, because the PSNI, in order to prevent Catholic roadblock, you know, uh, nationalists setting up a, a sort of sit down protests on the road and blocking the road, uh, usually occupy the Crumlin Road at least two hours before, um, uh, before the parade takes place. And uh, though they always try to get out of the Crum to get out of the Ardoin as quickly as possible after the parade, it can still take a little while. So. Um, for the Catholic, right, so while the Protestant, well, uh, your average Protestant Unionist is experiencing the par a parade that only lasts about five minutes, for Catholics it's a, at least a two to three hour uh, uh, interruption in their day. And in 2003, when um, the parade was supposed to be coming back at, 
at 6.30, the return parade was supposed to take place at 6.30, uh, and actually, and it broke its determination and came back at quarter to nine, the police had been present occupying the Crumlin Road for five hours, um, and had been doing things like, and that meant that uh, pensioners couldn't attend a local mass at the Crumlin, uh, at, the, at the Holy Cross Monastery, which um, in one of these, one of the multiple geographic quirks of North Belfast is located the other side of the Crumlin Road from the Ardoin. I don't spend too much time on all of this. However, um, and also, uh, so what we see in 2004, you have two uh, representing groups form on either side. So that's the North and West Belfast Parades and Cultural Forum, who are unionist, and the Ardoin Parades Dialogue Group, who are nationalist. And these are very broad institutions. They uh, incorporate within them representatives of every single sub-faction within these two sort of traditional communities. Now, these groups uh, engage in uh, the first proper mediation between these groups sort of starts in 2006, following mass riots in 2005. Um, however, this process was not really about resolving the conflict as much as it was managing it. So what they did is faced with the ongoing disagreement about whose territory the Crumlin Road was, they decided that they couldn't fix that. So what they would try to do instead was make the parade less contentious and hope that if the, if, if the parade stopped offending people, then that might solve the problem and we could just stop caring about territory. So um, they did a whole bunch of things. So their parade followers were banned from the parade. Um, uh, or, tra or carried through the common road on buses, so they didn't uh, yell at people anymore. Uh, alcohol was completely removed from uh, the return parade. No one drank uh, during. The Blue Bag Brigade was eliminated. And perhaps most interesting of all, the police presence <coughs> at the, uh, at the common road was reduced dramatically. Um, and it, it truly dramatically. And so in 2005, um, there were in, on the 12th of July 2005, uh, the Ardoin had been policed by over a thousand police officers. On the, in, during, on the return leg of the Tour of the North in 2006, which is in June, um, it was policed by six police officers. So the, P, the PSNI, um, and, this was, uh, and this police presence reduction was achieved through um, the effective delegation of policing responsibility to community activists on either side of the line. Um, so there was an incident during that tour of the north where two crowds of people um, gathered each side of the junction, uh, so, so one CNR crowd, one PUL's crowd, uh, gathered each side of the junction between Ardoin Road and Hesketh Road, and uh, it was only the intervention of the community marshals that prevented those crowds from engaging in, uh, from starting a riot, starting to fight each other. So now this, uh, see, th this was actually very successful. Um, the, there was no rioting between 2006 and 2009, and coming off a period of uh, two years of really intense rioting, that was a massive success. Um, however, that, success depended upon this policing ability, as I've already said. And unfortunately, in 2009, that ability, uh, at least on the Catholic side, to police their own community was decisively prevented uh, by a group uh, led eventually by that man, D. Fennel. So in 2007, uh, Sinn Féin accepted that the PSNI was a legitimate, that agreed that they would start to support the PSNI in its operations. This uh, reinvigorated uh, Republican dissidents, which had been uh, lying quite fallow in previous years. Uh, it did so in two main ways. Um, uh, you see a bit, you start to see a big uptick in violent dissident Republican activity following um, 2007. So, uh, in the year, well, so it's about in two, in, there were less than 20 violent dissident Republican events in 2007. Um, this rose to 91 in 2009 and 185 in 2010. 
but it also reinvigorated non-violent uh, dissident groups like Erigi and uh, the Republican Network for Unity. And it was the latter, um, though with assistance from Erigi <coughs> and activists, who, all, who uh, entered the Kremlin Road and who began organizing uh, protest groups uh, who, be who began organizing protests that, ex that rather than the previous APDG, um, who were looking for a more compromising solution with the, uh, with the parading organizations, with the Orange Order, or this kind of thing, they effectively stood for no parades on the Orange Road, and in doing so, uh, brought back the salience of the territorial issue. Um, as I said before, the previous negotiation process had only worked because uh, they'd been able to say that they'd been able to uh, uh, outflank the territory problem. Um, the dissidents refocused uh, attention upon it. And this effectively led to stasis. Because, um, uh, because of pressure from their dissident flank, um, the a uh, sort of more moderate negotiating group which had re which had reformed into a uh, which had reformed an organization called CARA, the Kremlin Aldoin Residents Association, um, had to start demanding for the at least for the end of the return parade, return leg of the twelfth of July parade. Um, this, however, was just completely unacceptable to Protestant unionism, for whom the twelfth of July, as we all know, is is the day and any acceptance by their negotiating team that we had to stop, we had to lose part of it, um, would have uh, led to that team becoming totally illegitimate within their own community and unable to constructively negotiate anymore. So you get three rounds of negotiation, nothing happens, uh, they meet, they disagree on this fundamental issue, the talks collapse. What, ha what, however, is happening in the background of this is the Parades Commission, under a newly, uh, under, under a newly more um, activist chair, um, Peter Osborne, uh, was becoming more and more fed up with the recurrent rioting that was happening every year on the Kremlin Road. Um, and, so he, and he really tried to push and his first attempt was to try and push the two sides to come to some sort of agreement. Um, he, spot, he, he, he actually got the PLO's Commission to intervene more strongly in, uh, uh, um, in organising mediations, which it had not done before. But when that, when that tactic failed, um, in sort of a, a, an act, or in, a, in, something, in something that's just an act of frustration, um, the PLO's Commission uh, took the choice out of the Protestant's hands and banned the 12th of July return parade in 2013. Which led to the part that most people are familiar with, which is the 2013 to 2016 Twiddell protests. Now, the Protestants were unsurprisingly furious at the loss of the return parade. Um, it came off the back <coughs> of the flag protests in Belfast. Um, it, it tied into a, a ongoing narrative uh, of Protestant loss, um, that they were being cheated of their cultural, uh, that their culture was being slowly taken away from them. And, and so, and the initial response to it was five nights of extreme rioting. The Orange Order saw this rioting, and while they were as annoyed as anyone else, um, they did not want that to continue. So they, so they embarked on a policy of channeling this anger into non-violent protests. Hmm. This was taken up um, by local organizations who then uh, initiated, actually uh, somewhat counter to the desires of the Orange Order leadership, uh, the nightly protest parades and the Twardell Peace Camp, both of which would last for the next three years. Um, now, these were bad in that they created a lot of cross-community tension, but they were good because it meant that the Protestants now had something that they could bargain away in any sort of negotiation that, um, that would allow, that uh, uh, they hadn't actually had uh, for a while. 
the However, like throughout that period of 2013, 2016, uh, the stasis had effectively thing, but had effectively continued. Um, the core disagreement of the 12th of July return parade uh, had not been resolved. This was uh, the breaking of the stasis was uh, precipitated by the murder of, my, of Martin McGibbon, an Ardoin taxi driver who was uh, kneecapped by uh, by some distant Republicans. Um, they hit an artery and he bled to death, uh, actually in the arms of his wife, who was a nurse and who, could, who tried but could not stop his bleeding. Um, the intense tragedy of this event um, made it a really public uh, force within the community of the Ardoin. A public vigil was held, headed by local priest Father Gary Donegan, and at that, at that vigil, uh, Donegan and uh, the newly widowed, uh, uh, I think her name is Joanne McGibbon, uh, both uh, railed against dissident republicanism, uh, but perhaps even and, uh, and demonstrated perhaps that the Ardoin community was would no longer be uh, influenced by perhaps more dissident republican voices. More importantly, though, it broke the stasis because the Protestants uh, did not protest on that night, and that dem and that uh, sign of respect. For the for the Catholic community, um, opened up, uh, gave uh, negotiators Jim Roddy and Harold Good the idea that this was actually a moment they could exploit to actually obtain agreement between the two sides. This happened. Um, the Orange River and Kara met, and they worked out a solution to the 12th of July problem. Well, because the Parades Commission had, um, sorry, I'm, I know I'm overrunning. Do you mind? Is it okay? yeah, yeah, finishing. Yeah. Because the Parades Commission had um, taken away the twelfth, I think that the Orange Order now knew that if they if they didn't press for its immediate return, that wasn't quite the same as voluntarily giving it up. They were more acceding to a negative situation that had been imposed on them by sort of a fait accompli, which they could sell. However, they still would not be able to sell the complete loss of the 12th. So the formulation that was obtained was they would agree to voluntarily give up the 12th return for a period of time, but they would engage in, uh, until such a time as CARA could agree to it being reinstated. And they then uh, agreed to enter a period of persistent talks with CARA um, in order to try and build the sort of trust and relationships between the order and the Catholic residents of the Ardoin to the point where they would be okay with the parade passing back up the road. Or as uh, uh, my interview with Tommy Cheevers, a major figure in that negotiation, put it, a parade. Not necessarily the same parade, but a return parade. This agreement was put to each community in June. Um, there was a bit of a problem in, in that June because it was rejected by one of the lodges and the West Belfast UPRG. Um, however, opposition was overcome uh, through methods I can uh, go over. Uh, I can I can doing the discussion later. Yeah. Um, and yeah. So, what are the conclusions from? This uh, from this process, I think that there are th there are three conclusions um, that we can take to say how do these seemingly intractable disputes get resolved. First, creative thinking. Um, it was always like uh, all movements towards success on the Cromlin Road were based around people taking this intractable issue of territory and figuring out how to redefine it and uh, redefine what it meant to be parade, what redefine what. Uh, why the parade was contentious and try and solve problems that weren't in, that were just completely ancillary to this intractable, <coughs> insolvable problem. <coughs> Second uh, requirement is freedom of action. People need the ability to uh, have to, to to move away from the intractable uh, vision of how uh, uh, of the problem. Uh, and taking away that freedom was what the appearance of Garg and the dissidents did. And finally, internal control. Um, the negotiation team needs to have the organisational muscle behind it to actually impose or convince 
uh, people uh, to, to either impose this deal upon people or convince people that they actually want to have that deal in the first place. And uh, I will end it there because I've already run too far too long. Thank you so much, Adam. Now, Adam. Adam was very kind to me when he was the chair yesterday when I presented my paper in overtime and also I had to uh, pay him in return, so sorry about that. May I now invite the two other presenters, uh, Dr. Macken and uh, Dr. McQuaid here, to please join us uh, up front here to uh, take questions. We have about 15 minutes or 20 uh, before lunch. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you heard the boss, so <laughs> once again. So 10 minutes uh, for questions, so please uh, raise your hand and uh, keep it precise. Yes, please. Just ask, um, how if you went through my dimension, is that how the process of resolved? If you can take that, is that a state higher governance or how to draw the launch of the future We'll take a few questions before answering. Is that OK? Yes. So uh, give some time for our speakers to uh, rationalize as well. Uh, any more questions? Um, I, so I guess this is kind of a broad question, but it made me think of uh, your paper. You know, this issue of internal control and kind of um, this issue of informal paramilitary policing and kind of running up against the rule of law. I was wondering if, if the whole panel kind of had any ideas on that and what that means moving forward. So anyone can answer, right? I think, yeah, it's just a general okay. question. Maybe one more before we, yes. Uh, this is for Sarah. Um, just in terms Sarah. of the okay. process of the in the past, has one of the areas that you think missed the boat in terms of timing? Okay, so may I now invite uh, perhaps uh, Adam to... Um, Actually, I'd, I've already taken up far too much time there. Can the other guys... Okay, yes. yeah. why not? Uh, what about uh, maybe well, Sarah? Well, I, pre I prefer to answer the last question. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> please do, go ahead. Yeah, the yeah. paramilitaries to the rest of you. Um, <laughs> um, okay, so timing. I think, no, it hasn't missed the boat, but the way that it has played out means that there are certain conditions in place now for how it can get on the boat. Um, and I think that that's not necessarily a bad thing. I think it's quite clear that s at some of the initiatives that has been taken at societal level to fill the policy gap is now feeding back into policies quite clear with the Storm and House Agreement, for instance, with the oral history archive, etc. So, so I think in a way it becomes more of a dialogue with what people have filled the gap with and then the kind of the stipulation and circumscriptions that are in the agreement itself for what can actually happen, right? Um, I think that there was, a, there was a very interesting suggestion at, um, at a former panel in terms of how can things be moved forward on reproductive rights, for instance, in Northern Ireland in the absence of an assembly. And one of the ideas that was floated was citizen assemblies. And so um, although the civic forum has kind of been done away with having, like, trying to reinvigorate these kinds of conversations in the absence of a functioning power sharing institution, and but then with what we might call a kind of a benign direct rule informed by citizen assemblies, I, I think that that might be um, a possibility now because I mean the politicians did reach like quite substantial agreement um, and so I think that there are things that can be agreed to be implemented without and actually easier to implement in the absence of politicians that they wouldn't necessarily protest too much about but one of the things that is of course still a problem is this idea of, and I'll try and make it short now because I'm realizing I'm using the 10 minutes to answer one question. <laughs> um, um, one of the things in, in, in radical disagreement, the idea about ra radical disagreement is also that you don't initially distinguish between domesticated and undomesticated forms of political antagonism. So you, you do include violence as a form of political antagonism. And that's of course exactly the problem with the past. Uh, who to include, uh, whether it's domesticated or undomesticated, uh, that distinction is, is something that people are still uh, <coughs> trying to make, which is also proving difficult. There you go. Yeah. Hope any, and any comment from <laughs> the other two uh, panelists? I mean, like, kind of responding to your question about 
paramilitary. The Sorry, yeah. responding to your question about paramilitary and policing, I can't, well, uh, I probably can't answer this as fully as, as kind of either um, Adam or Sarah could, but certainly within the kind of existence of the uh, black cab industry, there's a very strong sense that um, a lot of guides kind of have to clear a script in a way. And it's funny because these these tours are in many ways sold as very spontaneous and authentic tours and they have the potential to be like that um, but they are also kind of quite heavily scripted and it's never really you know an interview it's never really stated who who's the one but it's obvious like I guess who's the one approving that script and then um, I remember I had one um, really interesting participant I interviewed who is from um, a kind of Protestant unionist background and was talking about he sometimes takes his tourists to the um, Republican Museum that, that's um, on, on the fall so I was kind of asking him a bit more about that because I was like that's quite interesting you know like what's your motivation for going into that space etc etc had this really great conversation with him when it came to then giving him a transcript of, of our discussion um, that was the thing I had to take out um, and he basically was like, I don't want that in there. I don't, you know, and everything's anonymous because I don't want it to be known, basically, that even though this is something you do with tourists and with the public. So those pressures I certainly can feel in that way. But um, uh, I actually think, so it, it, there's an important distinction to be made, and um, John Tonge, I think, has, like a really good, has a really good article on this. Um, there's an important distinction to be made between um, what I describe in, as regards with the marshals and public order situations, um, which I would call shadow policing from uh, paramilitary, uh, or which, uh, following Tange, I call para shadow, uh, uh, shadow policing, um, from paramilitary policing and you know, the, the knee cappings and the, the uh, uh, corporal punishment deployed by the IRA to control, uh, to uh, enforce law in the absence of police during the troubles, uh, and also the EVF. Um, now, that shadow policing. I actually think is one of the is the result of um, Northern Irish society by necessity implementing a main a means of policing which should exist more broadly but doesn't because of the uh, modern uh, I mean I, I always hate using the word but neoliberal states. Um, uh, 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 decision uh, by shrinking the welfare state to uh, place more and more responsibility for uh, civic control onto the, into the hands of the police. But the fact of the matter is you can't do that in North Belfast because the police don't work. Um, they, they can't solve public order issues. You put a lie on police and saying, if anything, it can make the situation a whole lot worse. Um, so you, uh, the police very heavily rely on community activists to help them. Um, uh, largely because that's what works. Um, it, I still, the, it, it really has not been studied all that much. Um, like Neil Jarman did a few things on the mobile phone networks back in the 90s, but um, the who exactly is doing this community policing is still actually pretty up in the air because some ex-paramilitaries do do it, but at the same time, priests do it. Um, <coughs> I uh, some when you ask these guys how do you you know get kids to decide not to chuck a petrol bomb at someone, um, I've heard responses saying oh you know I give them a bit of slap of the round, slap around the head and tell them to go home, to um, you know I just tell them that what they're doing is go, is injurious to the cause rather than supportive of it, and they agree out of the goodness of their Protestant of their uh, Protestant you know, nationalist souls. You know, um, there really needs to be a lot more. And, but like there, really, there needs to be a lot more uh, done to understand this phenomenon and the tools that these community activists are deploying to uh, effectively control the behaviour of their communities. Okay, we can... Yeah, I just yep. wanted to say one thing actually mm. to Sean's question again yep. is that in terms of missing the boat it's clear that it depends on what you mean with dealing with the past because obviously there's a time aspect to that so if we're going to deal with victims provisions etc etc then we are about to miss the boat. <laughs> yep. Okay uh, maybe one more round of questions before lunch. Any further inquiries? <laughs>
probably not meant to ask a question since I'm filming the pod. No um, problem. <laughs> <laughs> is time, in terms of negotiations, is time not one of the things that actually works to people's advantage? Because it just creates opportunity for sometimes tragedy that becomes a lever or um, p- people's attitudes to change or people to wear out. You know, it, it kind of, it, it, there's an inevitability to the, all the sides want it to be fixed. Sometimes you just have to wait long enough. It's a kind of a reconciliation model, but on a much smaller scale. The problem I encountered uh, with looking at time as a factor is that there's no way to measure its impact. And effectively, the hypothesis becomes tautological because you're effectively saying, uh, oh, why did this, why did it take place now? Because there was time, because there was time it took place. And you know, uh, there's no way to sort of, um, given the fact that people just you know, continue to believe the same thing regardless uh, however long the time passed. You know, like I spoke to a guy in the Orange Order. He said to me ca- like categorically, I still have no idea why Catholics would even want to oppose our parade. It's great. Love it. Um, and, I, and, I, I, and while you know, interviews are problematic and they do you trust that, but I think it's fair to take him at his word on that because otherwise why would he? I, I, so... Um, yeah, so I, 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 time passing, I think, probably plays a role, but on the basis that I can't measure it, its effect, I leave it out and focus on things which, um, have, a more, which have a more differentiable impact. It, it does offer like, a way to end the panel, drawing us all together, because you would turn that old tragedy plus time equals joke, <laughs> right? <laughs> this would be time plus tragedy, I don't know. <laughs> how that would work out, but it would kind of speak to all our papers. <laughs> Maybe one more question. As a timekeeper, I uh, have to look at my watch all the time. Uh, any, any further inquiries before we close the panel? Nobody else has an answer. Please. Please. the best joke you've heard. <laughs> oh, God. I think the Margaret Thatcher one was my favorite. That definitely did just make me laugh, but I like scatological humor, so. <laughs> <laughs> Have you seen the Jake O'Kane bit he does on the parading? He does on the Twiddell parades. Oh, it's fucking grand. It's really, it's it's very good. I I wish it wasn't uh, you no know, the worst thing a human can do to put uh, uh, videos in presentations because if otherwise that was how that would be how I would start every single one of my presentations. <laughs> okay, if that's the case, then uh, well, actually we're finishing on time. And uh, so thank you once again for your attendance. So we're done with dealing with the past, now we deal with the, the, with the food. Yeah. And, uh, and the drink, okay? Thank you. Thank you. Cheers. Very interesting. Jokes. <laughs> <laughs>